The Historicity of Total War Troy The Trojan War is a very interesting semi-legendary event that occurred perhaps sometime in the 13th or 12th centuries BC. Most people's interpretation of what occurred during this conflict has of course been colored by Homer's account of it in the epic poem, The Iliad. There is also the famous movie Troy, which tries to take a more realistic historical approach to the conflict that has entered the public consciousness. This makes it a surprisingly troublesome time period for a total war game to cover. In this video, we are going to go over the purely historical background of the Trojan War and contextualize the historical kernel present in the Iliad. Bronze Age Greece was dominated by the city-state of Mycenae. They did have writing, utilizing the Linear B writing system to write Greek. It was written on clay tablets. It was a writing system that was based on syllabograms, that is, each symbol represented one syllable, and it was not very practical for writing the Mycenaean Greek language. It was an altered form of the already existing Linear A writing system which was used by the Minoans to write their language, Minoan, which was not related to Greek. Unfortunately, they didn't really use writing in this time to record historical events. Of course, Herodotus is the father of history, and really initiated this practice in the Greek world. While other cultures in the ancient Near East, including Egypt, Chati, the Hittites, and Mesopotamian kingdoms did write about historical events in texts like royal inscriptions, letters, and chronicles, they didn't have historians who compiled historical facts and tried to tie them into a narrative history. This lack of historians really affects our ability to tie the available details into narratives for this period, and it especially affects the history of the Trojan War, which probably took place in the early 12th century BC, on the eve of the Bronze Age collapse. As I mentioned, the Greek city-state of Mycenae was a dominant power in mainland Greece at this time. Of course, there were other powers in Greece at the time as well, including Sparta, Athens, Corinth, etc. In Crete, the famous Minoans had recently been overthrown by the Mycenaean Greek culture, either peacefully or after an invasion. They had used an alphabet called Linear A to write down their language, which we can perhaps call Minoan, which is a language that's not related to Greek. Linear A has not been conclusively deciphered, the famous Phaistos disc, which has also not been deciphered, also comes from this civilization. Some words, like labyrinth, are examples of Minoan words that exist in English today. With this short background on historical writing and languages, we need to analyze the political situation in Western Asia Minor. This is rather difficult to reconstruct, but we can do so with data provided by the most powerful kingdom in Asia Minor at the time, the Hittite kingdom. The Hittites called themselves Neshites, the people of the city of Kanesh, which is to the south of Hattusha. The reason for this is unclear, but perhaps we can try to figure this out with the help of the Anita text, which is probably from the 17th century BC. The Anita text is the oldest Hittite text, and in fact is the oldest text in any Indo-European language. In this text, Anita writing an old Hittite, recounts his conquest and destruction of the city of Hattusha. His capital was located at the city of Kushara, of unknown location. Anita even states that whoever rebuilds Hattusha will be destroyed by the storm god. Well, anyway, the next Hittite king we know a lot about, Hattushili I, who perhaps reigned a few generations later, was in fact based in Hattusha. But the people still refer to them as Neshites, people of the city Kanesh. Admittedly, this doesn't explain why both Anita and the eventual Hattusha based Hittite kingdom's people called themselves Neshites. Confusing. There was obviously some major ideological shift in the kingdom between the reigns of Anita and Hattushili. There was also a reason that the Hittites copied and kept the texts of Anita in their archives. Kushara did lose some of its importance when compared to Hattusha, and perhaps Anita's descendants decided at some point to move their capital city to the city that Anita so deeply despised. 
Throwing a wrench in this theory is the fact that Anita is not even mentioned in later texts, which makes him all the more problematic. Oh well. Anyway, the Hittites eventually came to rule over much of Asia Minor and became one of the truly great ancient Near Eastern powers of the Bronze Age. Their strength was on par with the kingdoms of Egypt, Babylonia, Assyria, and Mitanni. While the international language of communication in the ancient Near East was Akkadian, meaning that the Hittites would send letters to other kingdoms in Akkadian, in Asia Minor the story was a bit different. There were several different important languages and cultures in Asia Minor during the peak of Hittite power. Some of the local languages that were rarely used in, te in texts were Palaic and Chatic. There were no doubt several others that were not written down at all. As noted in the Iliad, the coalition of the forces defending Troy was not mono-ethnic, and they spoke several different languages. While the international language of the Near East in general was Akkadian, Hittite and Luvian served that purpose in Asia Minor. In the northwestern part of Asia Minor, where Willusa Troy is located, Luvian seems to have been the main language used, though we don't have too many examples of writing from those regions, unfortunately. The archaeological site of Troy is a bit to the north of the region of Ionia. The major power in Asia Minor at the time of the conflict, as I just mentioned, was the Hittite kingdom based in Hattusha. And, as previously mentioned, they provide some data for the geography and political makeup of the rest of the region. The region of Troy was called Wilusha in the Hittite texts. It seems as though Wilusha is related to the Greek Wilion, which then became Ilion and then Ilium in Latin. Wilion became Ilion due to classical Greek dropping the digamma, the W, the W sound. There were several Anatolian Indo-European language-speaking peoples near them, including the Palaeans, Luvians, Lycians, and some others that we know little about. We have a similar situation in the area to the north of the Hittite kingdom, approximately where the later kingdom of Pontus would be located. The Kashka tribes dominated there and were always a thorn in the side of the Hittites, who were never fully able to subdue their small kingdoms. Like the situation near Troy, it is difficult to reconstruct their history since we don't have writing from them themselves. There is a very short seal text from Troy in Luvian, perhaps confirming the theory that Luvian was the lingua franca in the area. There was a major kingdom to the south of Troy in this period called Artsawa. We don't know too much about this kingdom's history, but we do have a couple of documents from them. The most important document actually comes from Egypt, and is a Hittite letter written by the Artsawans to the Egyptians. The international language of communication in this period was Akkadian, but perhaps the Artsawans did not have a scribe who knew Akkadian well enough to draft a letter to the pharaoh. Apparently the Artsawans had sent one, but the Egyptians had not understood it, forcing the Artsawans to send a follow-up letter in Hittite, which was a language their scribes understood better. Unfortunately, this probably means that the peoples that lived in Western Asia Minor in this time, including the Trojans, were not exactly in the loop in terms of international communication, again limiting what we can say about them. This also explains the lack of evidence from the tribes and kingdoms in this region. We'll discuss this evidence in more detail in a bit. Going back to the Greeks, we should talk a little bit about their royal ideology. A couple, of, a couple of the important titles in the Iliad for the Greeks are Anax, Lord, and Basileos, King. Agamemnon, the leader of the Greek coalition, is called an Anax, and he leads several Greek Basileoses. Later on in Greek history, we see that the title Basileos simply means king and became more important than other titles. We can see an example here. This is a coin of Tigran II, king of kings of Armenia from 95 to 55 BC. The legend on this coin says Basileos Basileon Tigranu, a coin of Tigran, king of kings. However, in the Mycenaean period, the Greek titulary was a bit more complicated. It actually became simplified as time went on. Wanax later on came to simply mean lord. 
We also see it used in several Greek personal names, such as Anaximander or Anaxagoras. It is possible that Wanax did mean king in the Mycenaean period based on the evidence from the Iliad. It is also used as the title for Priam, who of course was the king of Troy and led a coalition of several other kings as well. This development is reminiscent of the development of royal titles in Mesopotamia. In the early dynastic period, in the time of the Sumerian city-state kingdoms such as Lagash, Uma, Adab, Uruk, Kish, Ur, etc., they had leaders that were mostly called Ensi, though some were called Lugal and some were called En. In the proto-historical Uruk period, from approximately 3500 to 3000 BC, the leader of Uruk, the most powerful city in Mesopotamia, was the En. Later on, all of these titles came to have strict, separate definitions. A Lugal was a king, an Ensi was a governor, and an En was a lord. In Greece, in the Mycenaean period, we have the Anax, Agamemnon, who was in charge of all the Basileoses. Of course, we know that Basileos later came to mean king, while Anax was lord. This is perhaps similar again to the Sumerian development, where the En was in charge initially, and then Ensi was used as another royal title, but then all of these became subservient to the eventual term meaning king, the Lugal. Perhaps these titles can play a role in the game, with the player of a smaller faction striving to become the Wanax in charge of other kings. Back to Asia Minor, Greece was known as Achiawa in the Hittite texts. Achiawa doesn't sound like it has anything to do with the Greeks, but in fact it does. It is related to the word Achaia. The Greeks in Homer are known as Achaeans, and of course there is also the region of Greece, known as Achaia. In any case, Achiawa perhaps refers to all of Mycenaean Greece, but no doubt it refers to at least a part of it. Now that we have some of the historical background information necessary, let us take a deeper dive into what we know about the history of the land Troy, and its relationship with the Greeks. There is also a draft of a letter from the Hittites to the king of Achiawa that refers to a past conflict between the Achiawans and the Wilusans, the Trojans. According to Hittite records, there were several kingdoms and peoples in Western Asia Minor, including the important kingdom of Artsawa and the confederation of Ashua. One of the kingdoms included in the Ashua confederation was Wilusha, that is, Troy. The Hittites fought with both of these kingdoms at various times. Eventually, at the turn of the 14th century, the Hittites invaded and forced the kingdom of Artsawa to become a vassal state, which really turned the political tide in the Hittites' favor in Western Asia Minor. This was no doubt concerning to the Mycenaean Greeks. As we see in later history, when the Achaemenid Persian Empire had taken control of Asia Minor, the Greek states were constantly inciting rebellions in Ionia in order to weaken the political position of the Persians. This appears to have been the case when the Hittites grew more and more powerful as well. In a partially preserved letter called the Tawagalawa Letter, an unknown Hittite king writes of a renegade potentate, Piyamaradu, who is known as the king of Wilusa. Some scholars have connected this Piyamaradu to King Priam of Troy from the Iliad. Piyamaradu is a Luvian name, Luvian being the other most important Anatolian Indo-European language of Asia Minor, along with Hittite. It is possible that Piyamaradu was related to the ousted royal family of the fallen kingdom of Artsawa, and his constant battles against the Hittites were his attempt at restoring the kingdom. He fought for many years, as several different Hittite documents from the 13th century, even a prayer of the famous Hittite queen Puduchepa, mention him as an antagonist. There is also a reference to the Achiawans providing assistance to him in his anti-Hittite resistance efforts. This means that the Mycenaean Greeks were absolutely involved in the politics of West Asia Minor and that campaigns were carried out by Greeks in that region. Many scholars trace the events of the Trojan War in the Iliad to the eve of the Bronze Age collapse, the beginning of the 12th century BC. In this time, many of the major centers and civilizations either collapsed due to conquest or internal problems, 
as in the case of the Hittite Empire or the city-state of Ugarit. Or they were extremely weakened, as in the case of Egypt under Ramses III, which lost a lot of its power even though it successfully repulsed two invasion attempts by the marauding sea peoples. While many of the details of the history of Troy are not known and it is difficult to reconstruct a clear historical narrative with the scattered bits of evidence at our disposal, we can draw a few conclusions from the historical data we do have. 1. Troy was a historical power. It was known to the Hittites as Wilusha, which was initially a member of a large coalition of kingdoms and statelets in northwestern Asia Minor, a coalition known as Ashua. 2. The Mycenaean Greeks were involved in the politics of Asia Minor to the point that they were in contact with the Hittites. The Hittite documentation clearly shows that the Greeks at times had an interest in checking the growing power of the Hittites. Known as Achaeans in the Iliad, the Greeks are known as Achiawans to the Hittites. 3. The Hittite documents refer to a conflict that centered around Troy. While the details are not very clear, the Hittites refer to a troublesome Trojan king, Piyama Radu, whose name may be related to King Priam of Troy. While the details of Piyama Radu's life don't match up with the details of the Iliad, perhaps they lay the historical foundations for the famous epic. The language of Troy and its surrounding tribes and kingdoms seems to have been Luvian, which was one of the main languages of the Hittite Empire. While Luvian was not the only other language in the Hittite Empire, it was more important than other languages such as Palaic and Chetic in this period, and it eventually came to be the only lingua franca of the Neo-Hittite kingdoms after the final fall of the Hittite Empire during the Bronze Age collapse. 5. It is also possible to say that while some of the historical details we know are reminiscent of events that take place in the Iliad, some of the details don't quite match up, which is normal since the details of an epic are often built upon a historical kernel, but alter things in order to make the epic flow. This can be compared to the Epic of Gilgamesh and how it was built upon the foundations of the historical king Gilgamesh. The Sumerian king of Uruk, who reigned sometime in the 27th century BC. It has been revealed that CA is opting for a kind of hybrid design for Total War Troy. While it doesn't take the complete fantasy route, it is also not completely historical. The player can pray to the gods and have them directly affect the game, for example, in terms of stats and other things. Many people have voiced their concerns about this, and I tend to agree somewhat. However, this is not the first game to have implemented such a system. Temples in Rome Total War, for example, have various effects on the city beside happiness boosts, depending on the god it is dedicated to. Temples dedicated to war gods affected the fighting ability of troops trained in that province. That doesn't sound completely historical to me. The Paradox game, Imperator Rome, also goes this route, allowing the player to choose which god to pray to, depending on that, that faction's pantheon, directly affecting the game depending on what that god is generally affiliated with. For example, praying to the war god improves troop morale. In those other games, this somewhat ahistorical implementation of offerings to gods or temples dedicated to particular gods did not really affect my immersion in those games, and I don't think that in particular this is a deal breaker for me. In terms of Total War Troy's historicity, I find one issue to be more important than all the other ones I just mentioned. The colors. Many have mentioned that in the gameplay videos posted so far, the game appears to be almost devoid of color and very sepia-toned. This is a very significant problem in my opinion. Art design is one of the main issues that affects the player's immersion in a Total War game, and it is not something that can be so easily overlooked. One of the major examples of this is the unit card controversy from Total War Rome 2. Many hardcore fans were upset during the launch of Rome 2 because the unit cards were all designed based on the depictions of warriors on a certain type of Greek pottery. Personally, while the style did grow on me, it still isn't my favorite and it clashes with some of the other artwork in the game. 
Shogun II, by contrast, had excellent, consistent art design, which really immersed the player in the medieval Japanese setting. It also has excellent, colorful environments. I keep emphasizing color here because many people have a major misconception about color in the ancient world. Things were absolutely very colorful. When we dig up a statue, it looks colorless or completely white or brown as if it was not painted at all. However, this is not the case. Walls, statues, art, quite a bit was colorful and exquisitely designed. For many pieces, the traces of paint can be used to reconstruct how certain statues or walls looked in ancient times. This is why it really bothers me that Total War Troy appears to have a colorless or sepia-toned environment. This means that rather than taking inspiration from history and archaeology, it is more like a sepia sky 300 comic book movie-like take on the Mycenaean Greek world. If this is the case for the design of the whole game, which seems like it might be, it will be very unfortunate. Of course, the other major problem is that the way that Total War's current engine is doesn't reflect the warfare of the time period. Units in the Bronze Age were not as organized as they are in Total War. Battles had more skirmishes, more falling back, more routing and rallying. One of the mods that has always championed this type of more historical combat is the series of realism mods for Total War games, especially Empire Realism, Napoleon Realism, and Shogun II Realism, with feature totally redone morale systems that better reflect reality. I highly doubt that CA has created such a system for Troy, since they never have even attempted to do such a thing. Of course, this is not to say that this issue of well-organized units is a problem exclusive to Total War Troy. It absolutely is not. In the Roman period, even in the medieval period and the Sengoku Jidai period of Japan, units were simply not organized the way they are depicted in Total War games. Things were more mixed. Germanic warriors did not fight in that way, certainly. Scythian nomads didn't fight in organized units the way they are in Total War. Even the more organized settled kingdoms didn't really have armies that purely fought in the way CA depicts them in Total War games. So, if it doesn't bother you in those games, it shouldn't really bother you now. Of course, I hope that the realism team comes back to mod Total War Troy and redo the combat system in a way that would better reflect the realities of Bronze Age Mycenaean Greek warfare. I personally view the Total War combat system as a kind of abstraction and gamification of reality. There is simply no way to realistically depict how these battles would have been fought in the way Total War games function. If someone wants to play a game that perhaps is a battle engine better equipped to show how small skirmishes and combats may have taken place a bit more historically, they can look at something like Mountain Blade Warband. Despite my reservations about the art design of Total War Troy, I am still excited about the game. It will be the first game to take place in such an ancient time period. This is very thrilling for me especially since I am a big fan of ancient Near Eastern history. I have always wanted CA to make a Total War based on the ancient Near East, be it the Sargonic period, the Bronze Age, the Old Babylonian period, or the Neo-Assyrian period. I personally hope that Total War Troy is CA's first step in making another fully historical Total War based on the ancient Near East, and the wars between the Sumerians, Akkadians, Babylonians, Assyrians, Hurrians, Urartians, Mitanni, Hittites, Egyptians, Elamites... You get the point. Unfortunately, this means that I feel that the Trojan War period is a tough one to tackle. It is a period where we have a lot of epic mythology that clouds the historicity of the period, even though we do have some historical data, as we discussed. We know about several of the kingdoms and tribes in the region, as well as about the Hittite vassal state of Artsawa to the south. I sincerely hope that CA was able to utilize the historical data effectively in order to construct an immersive campaign map based on Mycenaean, Greece, and Western Asia Minor, because even though it is a bit of a difficult time period to base a historical game off of, it can be done. <laughs>